Well, it's a pleasure, obviously, to be here with friends. But I'm going to start on a somber note, really somber. My hope is it'll end up being some kind of a liberating reflection before we get done for the evening. We have, uh, uh, if you could, no more photos if you could. I'm used to a classroom, nice and quiet. Thanks. We've had two events in the last five years that I believe signal the beginning of a very, very long, dangerous, and opportunistic endgame for the Industrial Revolution made out of fossil fuels. Let me take you back to the first event, July 2008. You remember that month? Crude oil hit $147 a barrel on world markets. And when that happened, all the prices across the global supply chain went through the roof. Everything in the civilization is made out of fossil fuels or moved by them. Fertilizers, pesticides, all of our construction materials, pharmaceutical products, synthetic fibers, it's all made out of fossil fuels. Power, transport, heat, and light. We've created a great and rather dangerous short-lived civilization based on digging up the burial grounds of the Carboniferous era. It's really all about that. You know, I got it just as an aside. You know, I often wonder if we, if we make it through this moment. I mean, I have my serious doubts, really. It's probably not a nice thing to say to all the young people here, but if we make it, I wonder what future generations of our species will think of us maybe 300,000 years from now. All the monuments will be gone. The only record they will have that we were here is they're going to have our CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide footprint square in the geological record. They're going to say, oh, yeah, back then they were the oil people. We had the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. They lived off fossil fuels, and they almost destroyed the planet in the process. When oil started to go over $80 a barrel in 2007, all the other prices started going up. At 120 a barrel, we had food riots in 22 countries because this afternoon we've got 40% of the human race living on under $2 a day. And when the price of wheat, barley, rice, and rye were doubling, tripling, and actually trebling, we had a billion people in harm's way. The UN, if you remember, panicked. They said, we've got an alert here. How do we deal with this? At 147 a bar barrel for Brent crude, everyone stopped buying. Prices were too high in the stores. The entire global economy shut down, shut down in July 2008. That was the economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock. We couldn't maintain that fictional credit-ridden, debt-ridden economy when the real economy shut down. Our world leaders are still dealing with the aftershock. No one wants to actually address the earthquake because then we'd have to ask some soul-searching questions about the reorganization of civilization. This is an end game. We now know in the business community, and this is maybe a good measuring, we actually know how far we can globalize the world based on fossil fuels and the technologies embedded with them. It's about the zone is between 120 and 150 a barrel. When it gets into that zone, prices go up and we get shut down in the economy. The reason we've hit this end game is we now have two milestones. Peak oil per capita, 1979. Global peak oil, 2006. In 1979, had we distributed all the oil reserves we had at that moment in time to everyone alive on the planet at that moment and shared them, that's actually the most oil any person could have. We found more oil since then, but populations have risen a lot fa faster. So if we distribute all the known oil reserves we have now to 7 billion people, there's less per person to go around. So when China and India brought a third of the human race into the game in the sunset of a second industrial revolution, at a 9, 10, 11, and 12% growth rate over 15 years, just too much aggregate demand against the supply of oil reserves. Oil prices go up, other prices go up, shut down. The proof's in the pudding. In 2009, oil went down to 30 a barrel. And of course, the good news is the bad news. It means there's no economic activity. As soon as we started to replenish inventories, oil prices went up, and they hit a shorter peak of 123 a barrel in the first quarter of 2012. Always look to Unilever and Colgate Palmolive if you want to know what's going on. The big consumer product companies, they issued their quarterly for the first quarter of 2012. They said profits are down to the shareholders because the price of oil went up, we had to embed that in all our products, 
purchasing power is slowing down. We are in a second shutdown right now. These are five-year cycles of growth, shutdown, growth, shutdown, replenish inventory, growth, shutdown. There is no way to get through this. Once we get in that zone of 123 to 147 a barrel, it goes down again. We have other fossil fuels. We have tar sands in Canada, shale gas in the U.S. and around the world, heavy oil in Venezuela, coal. Well, let me deal with uh, tar sand and shale gas for a moment. The only reason we are in these energies, we've known about them for a long time, is because the high price of crude oil is setting the benchmark for going to the more difficult energies. It's much more costly and difficult to get oil out of rock and sands than out of an oil well gushing out of the ground in Saudi Arabia. Tar sands is not competitive under 80 a barrel. And we used to think that price was prohibited for oil. As to shale gas, I'm looking at the studies. It apparently, I'm not sure yet, it looks like we have a bubble here. I guess it's Chesapeake is in real trouble, the big company. They've overinvested, overhyped. The energy company has gotten into it, the banks. And from what we're seeing, we're not sure yet, but some studies are showing that these shale gas deposits, what they're doing is they're projecting the amount of gas based on the sweet spots. And there's only a few sweet spots in every deposit. And you know how long it takes to get the gas out of the sweet spots? About 18 months. So now the new studies are beginning to suggest, we don't know yet, beginning to suggest a big bubble, overhyped how much reserves. And even when then, if you put them on world markets, it's fairly irrelevant. This leads us to the second event. We have these other fossil fuels, and even though gas is, burns better, a little less CO2, they're still emitting CO2. The second event is December 2009, Copenhagen, 192 heads of state show up there to address the entropy bill for the industrial age. How many engineers do I have here? Good. You know you cannot escape the second law of thermodynamics, right? You should tell the economists that. They don't study thermodynamics. So that's why I don't know anything about economics. We'll get to that in a minute. But the point is, this is not a metaphor. We, uh, we have too much spent entropy. That CO2 is spent energy. It's up in the atmosphere. And really, the long and short of it is we can't get enough of the sun's heat back off the earth. How bad is it? It's, it's actually right now terrifying. The first study, I did a book, some of you old-timers may remember, called Entropy in 1980, first studies on global warming. I continue to underestimate the speed of the feedback loops, and so did everyone else I know. Because we can't model those feedback loops. When we see them after the fact, we say, how do we miss that one? So, the most important single story in the history of the human race was reported two weeks ago. Almost no attention, not a single world leader made a single comment on it. And in Hawaii at the monitoring station two weeks ago, it was reported that we've now hit 400 parts carbon per million, not a peep from the world. We're, we're dead asleep on this. We, the, the parts carbon per million never went over 280 parts carbon per million in the atmosphere for the last eight, seven, eight 800,000 years. It tracks identically. As soon as the industrial age starts, the carbon goes up. We've now hit 400 parts carbon per million. Now, the reason this is important, I advise the EU, we went to Copenhagen, and we hope to talk the world into mitigating CO2 at 450 parts per million, stop there, and we'd only go up two degrees. And then James Hansen, who just retired as the chief climatologist for the U.S. government, said, we got our numbers wrong. By the way, no one even wanted to play with the EU. He said, that's too much. Hansen said, we had our numbers wrong. If you go up 450 parts carbon per million, the geological record shows us you go up six degrees, not three. And Hansen said, as a paraphrase, the end of human civilization, perhaps by the end of the century. What's terrifying about climate change that's never explained, is it radically changes the water cycle on Earth in one moment of time. That's what this is all about. We're the watery planet. You know, we go with other planets, we say, is there water? First thing we want to know. This planet, the ecosystems have developed over eons of history based on somewhat stable water regimes. They shift, but somewhat stable. For every one degree that the atmosphere temperature goes up, the atmosphere then absorbs 7% more precipitation from the ground. It sucks it up because of the heat. It throws off the whole hydrological cycle of the earth in one moment of time. 
So what we're seeing now is more bitter winter snows. And I'm always amused when the political people say, see, it's global warming. No, it's global, not global warming. It's cold out there. The reason we're having more bitter winter snows is because of the radical shift in the water cycle, which means we're getting more extreme events. We're getting more dramatic spring floods. We're getting more prolonged summer droughts everywhere. We're getting more Category 3, 4, and 5 hurricanes. We're getting more extreme volcanic activity everywhere. And this is just 2013. Our ecosystems cannot catch up to this change in the water cycle, and they are destabilizing everywhere. So all of our scientific models now show we are actually in real time the sixth extinction event of life on Earth right now. We have had five extinction events in 450 million years. When it happens, the tipping point comes and the chemistry shifts in the planet and we get wiped out pretty quick. On the average, it takes around 10 million years to recover that biodiversity loss. We're in the sixth extinction event on the models and the models show on the up end, and these models were done before the new readings of 400 parts per carbon per million, that we could lose upwards of 70% of all the life on Earth by the end of the century. As my wife says, we're, we're just not grasping the enormity of the moment. You're grasping it. You're out there with solar. But in our country, the energy industry has talked half the country into believing climate change is a hoax. And then the scientific reports last week, they looked at every climate change scientific paper that's ever been done, and 98% of the climate science, as the scientists agree, and 2% don't, and it didn't get any attention. This is mass denial. We are the youngest species in the planet. We're the babies. We've been here about 175,000 years, anatomically modern humans, and we are such hubris. You know, the odds aren't too good. 99.5% of all the species that have ever inhabited this little oasis in the universe have actually come and gone. This century is a moment of decision whether our species stays here. My European director has a baby that's one year old. I just can't imagine what it's like for that baby in the year 2000 to 2100. I can't imagine it. So we have the second industrial revolution is now in a long, torturous endgame of growth, collapse, growth, collapse. We're moving to these other fossil fuels. And as we do so, we're continuing to increase the climate bill with more and more CO2 up there. So what do we do? Let me share an anecdote. When Chancellor Merkel became chancellor, she asked me to come to Berlin in the first few weeks of her government to help her address the question of how to grow the German economy and create jobs. Now, that's not a small issue for Germany since they're the most robust industrial economy per capita by far in the world. So when I got there, the first question I asked the Chancellor is, Madam Chancellor, how are we going to grow the German economy, the European, or the world economy in the last stages of an energy era? The energies are becoming more expensive and volatile. The technologies based on the energies like internal combustion engines, centralized electrification, there's no S-curve left. And now the infrastructure made out of carbon is just too damn expensive to build and maintain. We need a new economic vision for the world. It has to be compelling. We need an economic game plan for the vision that's deliverable. It's got to move as quickly in the emerging nations as in the industrialized countries. We have to be off carbon, not low, not clean, off carbon, 30 years, everywhere. I think if we have any chance of beating this, we're really late. So we have to ask the question, how do the great economic revolutions in history occur? Because that's going to give us a road map of what the solar industry here and everyone else, what we need to do to get through the door here in time. The great economic revolutions occur all through history when new energy regimes emerge. They make possible more complex civilizations. They bring more people together, differentiate skills, integrate them in larger units. But the complexities of new energy regimes then actually have to require new communication revolutions that are agile enough to manage them. All through history, when communication revolutions converge, merge, and manage energy revolutions, we have the big economic paradigm shifts. They change temporal spatial relationships, how we live, they change consciousness, everything. I'll just start with the 19th century. I have a the book before the Third Industrial Revolution is called The Empathic Civilization. It's a 660-page narrative, so I won't go into it. My wife said, what were you thinking about? 
ADHD generation, you're writing a 660-page book. But we go through the entire narrative, if you're interested, in how these energy communication regimes emerge and their relationship to the shift in consciousness. But 19th century, first industrial revolution, convergence of communication energy. We had a very interesting communication revolution. We went from manual print presses, five centuries of that, to steam power printing. This was a big deal because we could put out massive volumes of cheap print material really quickly, and it was like the lower transaction costs on the Internet today. But then we had to have everyone literate. So we introduced public schools all over the world and created a print literate workforce with the communication skills to manage a really complex coal power rail driven first industrial revolution. Could never have organized that energy regime with an illiterate workforce. Too complicated. 20th century, we had another convergence of communication energy, a second industrial revolution, centralized electricity, the telephone. Radio and television became the communication media to manage, coordinate, and market a more dispersed auto oil era, a consumer society, and a suburban build-out. That second industrial revolution clearly on life support, you can smell it. The energies are more expensive and volatile, the technologies are antiquated, the infrastructure is in disrepair. And do not be deceived when you see those big, beautiful buildings in Asia, in the urban centers. That's second industrial revolution. They look good. They smell old. We had a very powerful convergence coming online now, a new communication energy revolution. And the solar industry in this room is going to be right there, right at the center of it. This is context. We had a very powerful communication revolution in the last 20 years. The personal computer, but mainly the Internet. And what's so interesting about the Internet is the way it's organized. I grew up on centralized communication, one to many, top down, radio, TV, newspapers, magazines. What's so interesting about the internet is not centralized, it's organized to be distributed. And the fact is, it doesn't vertically scale, it's peer to peer lateral power, and it's completely collaborative in nature. So, this communication revolution, and this happened in 22 years. You know, Berners Lee put that World Wide Web online in 1990. 22 year, two years later, we got, I happen to have mine here, we've got a third of the human race, 22 years, third of the human race with a cheap cell phone and now a Raspberry computer for 25 bucks, sending audio, video, and text, a third of the human race, gossiping on Twitter, their faces are on Facebook, and they're looking at the Google search engine, and they're doing all this at near zero marginal cost. If I'd have said that in 1988, that a third of the human race at near zero marginal cost would be in complete communication, distributed, collaborative, peer-to-peer -peer power within 20 years, what would you have said? That's half the revolution. That's what America doesn't get because in America, our entrepreneurs created the first half, the communication stopped cold and are going back to shale gas and tar sand, trying to take a distributed communication revolution and are putting it against a centralized energy regime. They won't get anything out of it. The second half of the story, this distributed, collaborative, peer-to-peer, -peer, laterally scaled uh, internet revolution is now merging with a new energy regime, distributed energies that have to be organized collaboratively and scale peer-to-peer -peer lateral power. Starting to sound familiar? Elite energies, coal, oil, gas, uranium, they're not found in the backyard, they're only found in a few places. They require huge military and geopolitical investments, which I don't have to tell Europe about. Two world wars, the Ruhr Valley, coal, oil, and Russia, it was a mess. Millions died. And they require massive capital to get them from the wellhead to the end user. These are the most expensive, elite, centralized energies, nuclear and fossil fuels in all of history. They're dying. That's why the energy industry, the old energy industry, is frightened to death of everybody in this room. I know, because I work with a lot of these, I know with these companies, they're scared to death. What are distributed energies? Those are energies that are found in every square inch of the planet. The sun shines all over this world every day. What is it, 45 minutes of sunlight can give us more power than we ever need for our global economy. And I'm always amused when people say, economists say, gee, you think we've got enough solar power to run the planet? Duh. This earth is from the sun. This is a fragment of the sun. Everything down here came from the sun, including the fossil fuel deposits. If we can't power this planet with the solar power of the sun, 
we're doomed. The wind blows across the earth 24 hours a day, harness 20% of it. We have seven times more power than we need. Underneath the planet is the hot geothermal core of red hot energy. That's the leftover sun. We can take it up at a moment's notice everywhere in the world. In the rural areas, we have the agricultural and forestry waste that can be converted back to energy. In the coastal regions, our urban populations have the ocean tides and waves. We have enough of these distributed energies to provide for our little species till kingdom comes. And let me say, you notice I mentioned the other energies? You know and I know solar is going to be right at the center. So do not worry. You get into partnership with the other energies because we know that solar will be at the center of this because this is all about the sun. But we need the wind, we need the geothermal heat, we need the agricultural waste, we need the ocean tides and waves, because each region is going to have to customize where they have the best frequencies. But solar is going to be everywhere. Germany proved that. You don't have to be sunny Spain or Italy to get the job done. So the internet communication technology, which is distributed, collaborative, and laterally scaled, is now about to merge, and it's starting to merge in Germany and Denmark and a few other places with a new source of energy that's distributed, has to be organized collaboratively and laterally scaled. It is a perfect fit. We're damn lucky. Now we've got to get through the door and scale it in less than 30 years. And let me just say before I start, if you think that's impossible, we did the first half of this revolution, the communication half, in 22 years. There's no reason why, with exponential curves, we can't do the second half in 20 years got to have a narrative. The European Union has made a commitment to a five-pillar third industrial revolution infrastructure to change the economic paradigm. It's the formal plan of Europe. I was privileged to develop the plan with the EU over the 11, last 11 years. It was endorsed by the European Parliament in 2007. It's working its way through the European Commission and in the member states, and again, Germany, Denmark, ahead. But in the next two years, watch northern France, watch Belgium, watch the Netherlands, we're going to have a whole lot of places here, and then it's going to spread really quick. Pillar 1, 20% renewable energy by 2020. A third of the electricity has to be green. This is not a nice suggestion. It's a mandate. Every region has to get there. Some are way ahead. Some are way behind. Pillar 2, how do we collect energies which are distributed? Now, interestingly enough, our first thought was, well, you know, we're going to go to Spain, Italy, and Greece. They've got a hell of a lot of sun. We're going to put in some real big solar parks high voltage line, we're going to ship it out to everybody. And the, and the Irish have that offshore wind, big wind parks, ship it out. The Norwegians have hydro, big parks, ship it out. None of us oppose this. I don't oppose these more concentrated parks. They're low-lying fruits. We can do them quickly. They're essential. They're not sufficient. What we have learned is we cannot maintain any continental economy in the world just on these concentrated parks. We like them. We want them. But we began to ask the question, if renewable energies are distributed everywhere in some frequency or proportion, why are we only collecting them in a few central points? And then it dawned on us, it, we were using 20th century thinking based on centralized, vertically scaled fossil fuels and nuclear power. We were just using the wrong model. So if renewable energies are distributed everywhere, where do we collect them? Everywhere we have infrastructure to collect them at. It's called buildings, buildings, buildings. Buildings use the most energy, create the most CO2. Parenthetically, does anyone know what the number two cause of industrial-induced climate change is after buildings? Anybody? No, that transportation is three. Beef production and consumption and animal husbandry. And I mentioned this. I did a book called Beyond Beef in 1990. I raised this, and the, uh, the beef industry said, Mr. Rifkin, you're totally bonkers. We're going to check you in. Now we know. Not one government head of state in 192 countries has made a single sentence statement on the number two cause of industrial-induced climate change. Al Gore won't talk about it. I love him. He won't talk about it. How serious are we, really, that we can't move to a more mid-level diet on the food chain, a Mediterranean diet, good for our health, good for the planet, and we're not even willing to talk about it? Wow. We have 191 million buildings in the EU. Homes, offices, factories, barns. Our goal is to convert every single building, retrofit it, the envelope, the apps, the inside, get it energy efficient, seal it up, 
and transform every single building in Europe to your own green micro power plant so you can get solar off the roof, not just with the photovoltaics and the thin film, and now we've got the photovoltaics that so we can put them in the glass and the, in, the, in the facade. It's going to get more and more efficient. The whole building is going to be a power plant. And then we're going to get vertical wind off the side of the buildings and geothermal heat from under the ground in the buildings, and we're going to convert the energy, uh, the uh, garbage anaerobically back to energy. We've got a micro power plant here. The new buildings, as you know, will be legislated to be zero emission and positive power. Buig is one of the 120 companies in my group. They did the first positive power building. Axiona in our group did the first zero emission building in Spain. But what's interesting about these buildings, how many of you have seen the Buig building in the Paris suburbs? It's drop-dead gorgeous. It sucks up so much sun that it's able to produce all of its needs and send surplus back to the grid. Within a year of these buildings going up, we have 25 universities that have done it. We've got private contractors now that are building suburbs with prefab at less per square foot than conventional. It's going everywhere. I was with Philip Stark. You know Philip Stark, the designer, two months ago? He's even putting out a prefab positive power building next month, a home. It go, once you can do it, everyone else sees how easy it is. Big for the solar industry. We're going to put solar on every single building in the world. Here's the analogy. First of all, let me say this jump starts the economy. The elephant in the room is always construction. Retrofitting, putting the envelope together, getting the apps in, getting the installation of the renewables on the building, that's 40 years, millions of jobs, thousands of SMEs to convert the entire infrastructure to power plants. Here's the analogy, Steve Jobs. In 1970, we had a few mainframe computers. Some companies were sharing information. It was centralized, hundreds of thousands of dollars for these computers. Steve Jobs and his kids come along. They're tinkering in their garage. They create the personal computer. Today, as I said, a third of the human race, near zero marginal cost, $25 Raspberry, little cell phone, boom. Similarly, today, we have a few power and utility companies generating fossil fuel and nuclear power. We buy it. But already in Europe with the feed-in tariffs, and now it's in 61 countries, everyone's going to have it. Japan just put in the biggest feed-in tariff in the world, and Premier Li and the new Chinese government is going to go much further this next year. So today we have a few power and utility companies. We buy it, but already in Europe we have several million buildings and sites sending back a tiny bit of, uh, producing a little bit of green electricity. In 10 years from now, we're going to have tens of millions of buildings on this planet, existing and new, creating their own green micropower. In 20 years from now, we will have six figures, several hundred thousand buildings producing a tiny bit of their own power. Why do I say that? Our team, our economy, we run the numbers. We have exponential curves here. Swanson Law on solar, we have wind. We have 20 years in both of exponential curves. The next up will be geothermal biomass, etc. Exponential curves are very deceptive. Economists usually don't factor them in. I'll tell you a little story. When I was 13, I had a kid across the street who was always on me. His name was Harry O'Connor. I'll never forget. Everything was competitive. So he said to me, and he always bested me every time. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a, I'll give you a million bucks. Or I'll give you a dollar and I'll double it every day for a month. What do you want? I said, give me the million. What are you, nuts? So then he got me. He said, go get a pencil and piece of paper and double that dollar. So I figured by the 15th, 8th time, $2, $4, $8. I said, I got this knock 15 times, 16, 17. Around 18 or 19 double, I started to get a little nervous. Around 23, I said, holy shit, what is going on here? By 30, I was over well over a billion. So we're on an exponential curve, and it's following this similar logic to what happened with Moore's Law and computing technology, where we doubled the knowledge, half the cost every two years. We're seeing it in solar and wind for 20 years. It's deceptive because we don't have half the lily pads in the pond filled yet, but we're moving by. And I kind of agree with Ray Kurzweil. He did, a, he did a little bit of a study. I think he may be a slight optimistic. I think he said eight more doublings on the exact curve we're on now. It doesn't even have to get better, and we're in 100% renewable within, by the end of 2030. Or maybe it'll be a little later. You can't beat exponential curves. So what's happening now, as the harvesting technology comes in for renewables, they're getting cheaper and cheaper as they scale, and the exponential curve is making them cheaper. And within 20 years, the harvesting technologies are going to be as cheap as cell phones today. It's on an exponential curve. And then, and this is what the energy industry is really scared of, the sun off your roof is free. 
The wind off your wall is free. The heat under your ground coming up, that's free. The garbage converted back to energy is free, nearly free. We are heading toward near zero marginal cost in energy, just like we did with information. It didn't cost much to put the infrastructure in for the Internet. And now it's near zero marginal cost to send the information. Energies run the same way. They're basically free. And you can do it. Any building you've put up is already, after seven years, you pay it back. That sun's free. Terrifying to the energy industry. Pillar three, we've got to store these energies. The sun isn't always shining. The wind blows at night. We need that damn electricity during the day. Water tables are now down because of climate change drought. They're not predictable. We've got to store them. We're agnostic. I like every kind of storage technology. We've got to get them online much quicker and scale them. Flywheels, batteries, capacitors, water pumping, air compression. But we put a lot of emphasis at the center of this network. We like them all, but hydrogen. Basic element of the universe, what we're made out of, it carries other energy. And what's good about it is it's completely modular. You put a solar photovoltaic on your building, you better have that storage in there quick. And you can put a hydrogen storage in a little teeny apartment or in a big utility complex at Eon in Germany. Pillar four, this is where the, the Internet comes together with the distributed energy to create an energy Internet. Millions of buildings connected, sensors and software millions of buildings, so that when you have a little bit of surplus electricity, green electricity, you can store it in hydrogen like we store media and digital. And then if you don't need some of that green electricity, by the way, here's how it works for some of you who aren't engineers. You have a solar panel on your roof, you generate some electricity. If you have some surplus you don't need, put the electricity in water, high school chemistry. The hydrogen comes out of the H2O into a tank. When the sun isn't shining, convert it in a fuel cell back to electricity. Engineers, this is a tiny thermodynamic loss compared to the conversion loss at every single stage of getting uranium and nuclear and fossil fuels to us. Pillar four, millions of buildings connected to an energy internet. If I have surplus electricity, I can program my software to direct it across an energy internet from the Irish Sea to the doorsteps of Russia like we now create information, store it in digital, share it online. Pillar five, Logistics and transport, electric vehicles are out. Fuel cell cars, trucks, and buses run on hydrogen will be out by the six majors in 2015-16. This is a done deal. We'll be able to plug in their vehicles anywhere, get green electricity from our buildings because you're going to put all the solar on there. And then wherever we park, there'll be a plug in every space around the world. Plug it in, get green electricity. And let's say you're at work, your car's out there, software and computers monitoring the grid. If the price goes up, you sell your stored electricity back. If all your fleet around the world is electric and fuel cell, 25% the fleet, so most cars aren't running most of the time. With car sharing, it's going to change. 25% of the fleet can power the entire world, eliminate every centralized fossil fuel power plant we've got now. Pillar five, transport. Now, let me say this to you in this industry, because you're going to be the center of this in renewable industry. They're all going to play a role. You're going to join with them and create a lobby across the board here. These, these five pillars are only components. They're totally meaningless. Your solar is meaningless by itself. All of these are meaningless by themselves. It's only when we connect them that we have a general purpose technology platform that sets out an infrastructure for a new economic paradigm. Obama made a big mistake. He wanted a green economy. He wants a green economy. He spent billions on a green economy. There isn't any green economy. Do I have anybody here from the States? There is no green economy. Why? He vested those billions of dollars in standalone, isolated, one-off projects, a solar factory in one state, an uh, electric car factory in another state, unconnected. What he didn't realize is the great economic shifts require communication and energy revolutions to come together and then form an infrastructure like we did in the 19th and 20th century. Second Industrial Revolution, the industries at least, and they were a little nefarious, but they at least came together and knew their interests. It wasn't enough to have the automobile. Then you had to have centralized electricity for electric power tools so that Henry Ford could make cheap cars and get them off the line. But at the same time, the highways and roads have to come in as the cars were coming off the line, and we had to have the gasoline and oil pipelines and gas stations in as the cars were coming off the line. And then we had to have telephones so we could connect to rural areas for suburban build-out and communication so we could create a much more dispersed society. We did it all together. 
the juvenile infrastructure, 1905 to 1929. Then I hiatus, depression and war. Then the interstate build out, the suburban build out. We did it all in another 20 years. First and second industrial revolution, the infrastructures came in, the juvenile infrastructures in 20 years each. And this is the 21st century. And we're talking about 2050, 2060, 2070, my lordy be. My lord. I think we can do better than the 19th and 20th century. We learned this lesson in Europe, and this is going to sound familiar. We put in the feed-in tariffs. We got a lot of solar and wind up there. Pillar 1's been successful, but we didn't move Pillar 4, the energy internet. So we got this 60-year-old draconian power grid that's centralized, servo-mechanical, only goes in one direction, that's what it was designed for, and it leaks 20% of its electricity. And we're trying to get thousands and th millions now of small players into that grid. How the heck does it manage peak and base loads? It's just a mess. Then we didn't move pillar three quick enough storage. So we have regions that are 20, 30, 40% green. Navarre and Aragon, Spain, they're competing for the prize. They're 70% green electricity, and we are losing three out of four kilowatts with your solar and wind. How do you invest when you lose three out of four kilowatts on the average? Then our car companies in Europe are petrified <laughs> because they're putting out their vehicles. They spend billions on tuning up for, tooling up for electric vehicles and now fuel cell vehicles. And if the rest of the infrastructure doesn't phase in, they've got nothing to plug their transport into. This is an infrastructure revolution. It isn't about selling solar one-off product lines. This has to be scaled, and it's scaled by laying down infrastructure where all these industries come together in regions and lay down the infrastructure together. Otherwise, this will be a complete waste, and we'll, you'll be sitting here in five years from now, and you'll have some few more houses and buildings you put solar on. It's got to scale laterally in a much more quick fashion, but it means all the industries have to come together to make this happen in each region. The music companies, the reason... The reason you're not taken seriously, those photovoltaics and thin film, the same reason the music companies didn't understand Napster. When millions of little kids, apparently they had nothing else to do after school but figure out ways to find software to share their music. And the music companies thought it was kind of funny, and then they went out of business in five years. And the newspapers really didn't understand the blogosphere. Millions of people sharing news, information, entertainment. Now they're out of business, going out of business. They're creating blogs to find value. And I'm in publishing, and the publishing industry has been wrecked by the low and near zero marginal cost of books and information going up on the Internet. So that's why when we talk about millions and millions of little places where you're putting solar on, they say, well, who, that doesn't give us any, because they see this big, huge nuclear power plant. What they don't realize is that when millions and millions of little players are putting just a tiny bit of green electricity over a grid that goes across continents, that energy electricity dwarfs anything you can possibly imagine with a little teeny nuclear power plant or coal power plant. But this energy is sustainable, it's post-carbon, and it works with the rhythms of the season. This five-pillar third industrial revolution, in which you're in the center on the energy part, what it does when it creates this infrastructure is those five pillars then create what we call an intelligent infrastructure, the first in history. You notice how uh, uh, Siemens, IBM, Cisco, uh, GE, they're talking about the smart cities. Three of the first three of those companies are in my group, not GE. And they want to talk about the intelligent society. You see the ads. What they haven't really figured out is what do they mean by intelligent. This whole infrastructure is intelligent. So you put the solar and the other renewables on, you put in the, the storage, you put in the energy internet and the transport, and it's collecting big data every single moment. It's collecting big data on the energy flows in every aspect of the system in real traffic. So it can create algorithms and figure out how that energy is to be used moment to moment. Let me explain the importance of this, of what you're doing with solar. Whether any company, any industry, or any economy succeeds or fails in this transition between a second and third industrial revolution, the second is dying, the third has to scale in. It will have very little to do with your labor costs. They're becoming a smaller part of the mix with technology displacement. We can talk about that Q&A, the jobs. It's going to have everything to do with energy costs. 
And I'm going to let you in on a little secret that you're going to share with all of your colleagues in the industry. And it's what is the nature of productivity? This is a key to a turning point in your narrative. What's, what creates productivity and growth? In economic theory, we always believe it's two factors, and that is machines, good machines per worker, and worker performance. This is a little secret they don't want you to know about. When Robert Sola won the Nobel Prize for Economic Growth Theory, he let the secret out. It's embarrassing. He said, we used to think it's machines and worker performance, but when we track the Industrial Revolution, that only seems to account for about 14% of the productivity and growth. So Robert Solo asked, where did the other 86% of the productivity and growth come from? And you know what his answer was? Quote, this is a measure of our ignorance. How could economists not know? The reason they didn't know, and this will amuse all the engineers here, when classical economic theory was being penned in the late 1700s, by Enlightenment philosophers, the big rage was Newton's physics. Everyone used Newton's metaphors to try to be scientific. So, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Adam Smith used that. He said, oh, yeah, the invisible hand of supply and demand. Got it? When Baptists say, made the comment that supply creates demand that then stimulates more supply that creates more demand, a body in motion stays in motion <laughs> unless obstructed by it outside force. The only problem with penning economic theory based on Newton's physics, it really doesn't have much to do with economics. Economics is based, engineers, chemists, and architects here, it's based on the laws of energy, the first and second laws of thermodynamics. They weren't discovered by scientists to the late 19th century when engineers and chemists were studying energy and entropy losses in machines. All economic activity is taking low entropy inputs from nature. It can be rare earths. Everything is energy, materials. So it has low entropy, available energy, concentrated to do work. We take it out of nature. We convert these materials and fuels and everything else. Each step of conversion, there's an entropy loss. You never break even. You always lose, right, engineers? Eventually, even the things you make go back to nature with a loss and are recycled, correct? Every engineer, every chemist, every biologist, every architect, every urban planner is required to take thermodynamics. Not a single economist is required in any MBA or PhD course. They have no clue. We now know where the other 86% of productivity comes from. It's crucial for your industry to tell this story. Bob Ayers over at INSEAD, that's a sister institution with Wharton where I teach. Wharton's the oldest business school. I teach in the executive ed. We've got other guys that have done studies on our team. When you track and put one more factor in, you have machines, worker performance, and you add thermodynamic efficiencies, track it, and it accounts for almost the rest of the 84% of the productivity. We now know that 84% of productivity is thermodynamic efficiencies. Think near zero marginal cost. That is ultimate efficiency. That's what terrifies the old industries. This is about productivity. So when an environmental activist says, we've got to be more efficient in our energy, and an economist said, that's no growth. The economists have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. It's 84% of productivity. This is a big selling point. So if those five pillars can begin to create big data, which they will, with algorithms to manage the energy flows, they can dramatically allow businesses embedded in those infrastructures to use that information to reduce their energy costs, increase their thermodynamic efficiencies, and raise their productivity through the roof. The second industrial revolution energies and technologies took us from 3% efficiency to 14% in 1970, over the century. It leveled off. We can now go from 14% efficiencies, get in the technology here, to 40. And then engineers, we, we have to level off because of thermodynamics. This is dramatic. And this has big consequences. Let me just give an example of the utility industry. When we first came out with this model, the energy companies weren't happy, they're still not. Only one big energy company's joined us, really. I mean, BP, Dutch Shell, they're, they're just nothing. GDF Suez is doing some stuff. Only one, really. The utility companies did not like the model. They said, no, 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 we don't like this model. We like to generate power, sell electricity, end the story. We said to them, you know what, we've got a better model for you. And now we're winning over the transmission companies. We said, get used to it. With the feed-in tariffs, we now have several million people feeding energy to you. We're going to have tens of millions and hundreds of millions within 20 years, like the Internet, exponential curve. We're going to package it with our producer and consumer co-ops, and we're going to send that energy back, electricity back to you. You run the energy Internet. 
And the way the transmission company, you know how you'll make money? By selling as little electricity as you can sell. Yeah, they, said, well, they think, oh my Lord, this guy's off. Then we use the classic IBM case study. This is a cliche in every MBA class. And that is, in the 1990s, their cash cow, the IBM computer, was in trouble because all of a sudden, Korea, bless you, Korea, Japan, everyone had the same computer. There was no margins for profit. So IBM said, well, what does the world need from us? Not a computer. We better reinvent ourselves. And they did. And they said, what we have that the world needs is we know how to manage information. Now, IBM, Cisco, HP, they're all managing information. Every little company has a CIO. What we're saying to the transmission companies, if you want to stay in this game, we're going to produce the electricity with our solar. We're going to impact, send it back to you. You run the energy internet. And the way you're going to make money is by setting up partnerships with thousands of small, medium, and large companies. You manage their energy flows the way IBM Cisco manages the information. And then you reduce their energy costs, increase their thermodynamic efficiencies. They can measure it with a dramatic increase in productivity, and they'll share their productivity back with you, and you'll make more money the less electricity you sell. And we are winning over the utility companies. Right now, my global team, TIR Consulting, we do master plans to get the infrastructure in place. We're doing Nord Posdi Calais. Anybody from there? That's the oldest industrial region of Europe, right down the street here. They're the second biggest industrial region in France. And ERDF has joined us, Michel Ballon, Poglio at EDF, Bouygues, Rexall, Schneider, Renault, Nissan, Alstom. This is a turning point. These are big French global companies. They're not leaving the second industrial revolution tomorrow. None of us are. But they understand it's like the move from the first to the second industrial revolution. The companies that survive we're able to be in two portfolios and make it quickly into the second over 20 years. The companies that don't survive are going to stay in the first. And we don't even need the uh, utility companies because Schneider and our group and other companies are setting up ESCOs. We can package it, help cluster these energies and the productivity and just send it back to the grid. The way this is going to come in, the way this is going to come in is like Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi was improbable. It moved from house to house, building to building. The third industrial revolution comes in like Wi-Fi. When a region like Nord Posti Calais starts to set up a node, immediately jobs, businesses, income, day one for 25 years. That's the elephant in the room. You don't wait. And as you're phasing it in, the new efficiencies from the productivity really jump the economy each year. It's like exponential growth. But then they have to find another node because if they have a surplus of green electricity because they had a lot of sun that week, they want to get some of that up on the energy internet. And if Eastern Europe at night's got a lot of wind blowing, they want to get it up to Ireland for their electricity. So while solar is going to be at the absolute center of this network, what we need to see is an energy internet across continents because like Wi-Fi, it wants to go to the, the edge, the infrastructure. And the more diversity you have in your energy sources on the sun, the wind, et cetera, one region shares with the other when they have surplus. It's the way it works. The good thing is the sun is just about everywhere at some point. So the EU is ideally positioned, but now we've got to close the deal. We had a meeting of summit, as you know, this week with the energy ministers, and we need to create the codes, regulations, and standards for solar and the other industries and the pillars, create the incentives for the other four pillars like that we did with the feed-in tariffs, and lay out, each region has to lay out a customized infrastructure and interoperably connect with the next and the next and the next so we have a completely seamless infrastructure for an energy internet, a logistics internet, all across Europe. So a billion people, 500 in the union, 500 million in the partnership regions, can engage it near zero marginal energy costs. How's that for commerce in the 21st century and off carbon? This is not a climate plan and an energy plan. It's an economic paradigm shift. It will more quickly get us off carbon and address climate change than we can do. And this industry has to be at the center and lead the renewable energy network. As we say, be a mensch, be out there, join in your industry, bring everybody in. We got to do this together. This is infrastructure all the way. Last thoughts on this. Uh, I think as, <laughs> these five pillars are common sense. If there's some other plan B, I have no idea what it is. You got to do renewables. You, they're distributed. You got to find a way to get all the infrastructure and install them on all the infrastructure so everything's a micro power plant. Put in the storage so we don't lose three out of four kilowatts. Put in the energy internet so we can share surpluses and lulls across regions and then plug it into transport. Is there anything else we need? infrastructure. But 
We can't make this happen if it's only about technology. We need a dramatic shift in consciousness in less than a generation, or we won't have the passion, the commitment to go with the narrative. We've got to move from geopolitical thinking to biosphere consciousness in one generation. The biosphere is, is a scientific term, as you know. The sheath, from the stratosphere to the oceans where they're living and geochemical processes are constantly interacting, creating this very complex choreography that maintains the stability of this fragile thing called life on Earth. I am guardedly hopeful. On the technological level, I am because we did half this revolution, the communication in 20 years. The second half is moving exponential, solar and wind. I think we can lay that out in 20 years. But I'm also guardedly hopeful because we've got kids coming home all over the world in less than 10 years, which is amazing to me. And they are thinking biosphere consciousness. They're asking their dad why he's using so much water while he's shaving. They're like little police. They're asking their mom and dad, why is the TV on? No one's watching the TV. Why do we have two car shares? Why not car share one? And this is the one I'm fond of. We got a lot of kids coming home now asking their parents where that hamburger came from on their plate. And the kids are actually asking, did it come from a rainforest? Where they knocked out the trees for four inches of topsoil for three years of grazing. And if they eliminate the trees, the kids are asking their parents, what happened to all the rare species of life that lived in that tree canopy? And the kids are smart enough, they're learning that if the trees aren't there, there's no sink for the industrial CO2 to absorb. So it means the temperature of the planet goes up somewhere, and some farmer, she can't feed her kids because she's got too many floods and droughts because of the hamburger. The kids are learning ecological footprint. This is so new. And it's actually, you can measure your footprint against the biocapacity of the planet. They're learning that everything we do has an ecological footprint that has an impact on some other family, some other creature, or some other ecosystem. They're learning that we are all interdependent and the indivisible community we live in is this biosphere. We don't give up our national ties, our religious ties, our blood ties, but we live in a biosphere. These kids are connecting across the internet, soon across the energy internet that's gonna be powered by solar power. And they're gonna be able to think that there is a mesh in the energy flows of the planet as they are in the social media sites on the internet when millions and then hundreds of millions and then billions of people are sharing their solar and other renewable power because you did it, they're going to feel personally responsible and they're going to get more attuned to the climate change, the sun's changing during the seasons. They're going to start to see how connected they are back into nature, not just plugged in connected, but connected to the flows of this planet. So what you're doing here with solar, it's a big tutorial. It isn't just about the energy, as you know, and the efficiencies and the economic paradigm, it's a shift in consciousness where we all realize we're sharing the biosphere together. We're sharing the sun together. And it's through that collaborative social commons that we're learning to live in one biosphere community. So I guess what I would say to you, you didn't need me to come here. Some of you have been pioneering this for 20 years. You're moving the industry. We're grateful, but it's not moving quick enough. We've got to scale. I am so tired of pilot projects and one-off little experiments so some local jurisdiction can take a photo. And you're tired of it too. We want to scale. We want to scale all five pillars. We want to get every region to lay out master plans. And if some of you want to talk to me later, maybe we can see how we might work together in some of the regions and countries we're laying out plans. We'd love to have involved. But what I want you to do is redouble your efforts, bring in the other renewable energies with you, Start to think of what you're doing as infrastructure that requires other industries, construction, logistics, IT, electronics, et cetera, so that we can actually see this as a paradigm shift. We do not want to be here in 10 years from now, maybe with a little bit of profit, but in 10 years from now, and we don't have this online. It would be particularly tragic since it's exponential on the curve. So let me say it's my pleasure to be able to be here with you, really, because you're out there actually doing it. But what we now need to have is hundreds of millions of buildings with solar. Hundreds of millions of buildings. And we're going to have to do that in the next 20 years. So we can get off carbon, reduce the climate's temperature, hopefully have time to reheal this earth, and provide a more just and humane quality of life for our kids and grandchildren and the other creatures we have to live with on this planet. All right? <laughs>